my presentation is less directly about OZQL and more about kind of the tools that were developed as you know as a result of working on OZQL. And he also gave a great introduction on it. And there's really not much that needs to be said. Essentially, OZ is a uh, standardized data model and all data in it is serializable. And because of that, we have the restriction that it doesn't point to any data, right? All, all that data is literally just pure values that are memory independent. And that becomes an issue because um, the standard doesn't specify things like objects being sorted in a list. And if I have a list of all lanes or all roads or all objects, and I want to find an object based on an ID, then any sort of <coughs> query I perform from one object to another or from road from one road through a network of roads is going to be very expensive because I have to iterate right after iterate through the entire list of objects to find the object every single time. And so it was obvious early on that we need some sort of uh, some sort of library that reorganizes that data in a way that becomes easier to query. And that was kind of the, the origin, the conception of OZQL. But um, as the title said earlier, I want to focus on some useful snippets that I kind of wrote along the way. Um, and specifically, it'll be on these four topics. So the first one is that uh, I want to use something like the requires keyword, and I'll get to what it means in a moment from C20, but um, due to restrictions, I can use only C17 features. And uh, I wanted to imitate that in C17. Then uh, the remaining points will build on top of that. Um, the first one is a good reason to use generic free getters and how to implement them. Um, then based on that, we'll, we'll, we'll see how to succinctly specialize the, the getters that we're writing. And based on that, we can then move on to composition of classes using inheritance, which um, lets us save even more on like code redundancy. And in each of these topics, I'll try to focus on why I would even want this, or some sort of motivation, um, and then to move on to how to implement it and how it works a little under the hub, how the compiler makes it work. So the first one is uh, yeah, type checking or also duct typing. We want to know if I get a type that I'm not familiar with, if I can still use it as though it's a familiar type. And for that, I need to check if it has uh, certain member variables or member functions that do what I would expect from a different type. <clears throat> and what motivated this in OZQL is that I have a OZ namespace. That's where all the OZ data is in, and it's pretty much a pure data interface. There's no implementation of an assignment operator. There's no plus or minus that I can use for point types. And uh, in this case, I'm asking myself, OK, how can I get the X coordinate from any of these types? And I also have my own OZQL type where it's just an X member, but in these cases, I have to call some different function to actually access either the, the X value or I have to first access the underlying point type of some other point type. And now I want a uniform way to access the X coordinate because I'll have lots of methods that, for instance, want to get the distance between two chains of points, and then I'll have to compare the coordinates and perform calculations on them. And so the Simple, naive way to go about this would be to just implement a getx method for each of these types. Now, I'm not happy with this because uh, this example isn't too egregious, but we have some duplication here. Right? We have uh, essentially the same implementation for two different types, uh, once for vector 2D and 3D, and then once for boundary point and logical boundary point. And there's also quite a bit of noise. We have always this double getx every time it would be much nicer if we could just have a single implementation um, and then inside that implementation we disambiguate the different cases we check the different types and perform you know different calls based on that and uh, what's also an issue is that these are all different types even you know some of these are external types some of these are my own like OZQL types and chances are these implementations are going to end up in different files and, and so if a maintainer looks at the code and they want to find a special implementation, they'll have to search the entire project uh, to find all the getx implementations and then select the getx version that they're actually looking for to see how it operates. And so that's another reason why it would be nice if, if we're all in just one single implementation, because at the end of the day, um, behaviorally, that's it, it does one thing regardless of the type. 
So lots of reasons, right, why why I would prefer a different way to handle this. And in C oh in C plus plus twenty, um, the way to go about this would be, or one very good way would be to essentially have one get x implementation and then to use uh, if const expert paired with requires to check what this type can do. Now, if const expert, right, that's a compile time uh, feature and it allows the compiler to look at um, the, the type that's, uh, well, not as well, it's essentially evaluate the expression inside the const expert at compile time and based on that, generate an implementation for that function. So if we're passing a type that has x as a function, then this, uh, the, in the resulting binary at the end after compilation, well, we would only have this expression here inside the implementation and the rest wouldn't even exist. So this doesn't have any sort of performance cost. And the requires uh, keywords essentially checks if the command inside these braces is a valid expression. And if it is, then it kind of returns true. And so this if condition would be true and would enter the inner block. That's great. We can just check, does, does our type have this uh, syntax, then use it. And we can try all the cases. And at the end, if none of them match, we can give an error with a little bit of a error message to be a bit more detailed. Uh, but in C++17, we don't have requires. And so a, the common way to, to go about it would be to introduce our own type traits and have each of them you know, be a different type trait that evaluates to true or false. And that way we can check these things. But then how do we implement those? Well, one way would to be take a type trait, give it a second template type that's uh, kind of automatically derived. And in this case, for the default case, uh, the value would be false. And then we write a specialization that here uses void t to evaluate whether the expression tx is a valid expression, right? It doesn't do anything with it, but it just looks, does tx actually exist? And if it does, then the value should be true. And we can do a little alias here to not have to um, write this colon colon value and keep it nice and short. But there is a bit of a problem with that, which is if a user now has their own type, they would be, it's possible for them to write a specialization here for their type that destroys this behavior that we're actually testing. Now, no user in their right mind would do this. They don't get anything out of it, um, but if we can avoid it, we should. And in this case, there is a way to avoid it. And that's not to use a type trait, but instead to use a template function that we're overloading. And so here we kind of do the same trick. We have a default type, and here this default type gets assigned if the expression is valid to the type of that expression. And then we have an overload where it's gonna be the alternate case. If this isn't a valid expression, then substitution failure occurs and the compiler will simply select the other version that is still valid and that one will return false. But in this case, we still have a problem, namely that a call to this function is now ambiguous. Both of these, would, we can resolve this by changing the signature of the default case or the, the invalid case by making it variadic. And this way the compiler will prefer whichever matches the exact number of arguments. And only if there is no match, then it'll choose the variadic version. And now this has X works as we want it to. And we can make a little improvements. If I go back, you see here, this is like the second template type and it's defaulted. And that also kind of addresses uh, Jan's concern earlier is that here I could just add a bogus type, but if I make that dependent and move it into the return value, uh, return type I mean, then this is no longer an issue. Now, if a user mistakenly adds a second argument, they're gonna get false as they should, and we're perfectly safe, right? There's no, there's no messing it up anymore. That's exactly what we want. So now we can use this has x and uh, test it. I have a structure x or class x and it has an x value and another function x which has x as a function and it behaves exactly as we want, has x returns true. 
has x a function x is false because we are in order to actually access x we would have to call it instead of you know it just being the name and as a sanity check a case like an integer doesn't have x as a member and so that too is false and just as an addendum uh, if we actually now specialize a has b, oh should be an x <laughs> if has x void then we would have to not say t colon colon b but we would actually have to check the call of b so we have to instantiate b and then see if we can call it as a non-static function to see if that function exists but i'm still not happy with this but yeah so right the issue is i have so many um overloads uh, uh, type traits or function overloads i would have to define because this is just for x and i would need lots of other versions for a function and for other types so what i would like is something in a syntax similar to this, where I can put the expression inside uh, as an argument, I can pass it and have a common name for all tests. But obviously this wasn't work, wouldn't work because X isn't a valid expression in this context. So the realization is that what I need to do is to make X dependent on an unknown type. That way the compiler can't check it outside of a template resolution context. And the way to do that is, well, I have to supply an unknown type and I can do this by passing a lambda. So now if I combine this and I say has member is, it receives a lambda with this expression, I can define it such that um, I'm now in a template resolution, right? I have two versions of has member and one of them has a return type that requires the expression of this lambda that I'm passing instantiated with the type that I'm testing for to be a valid expression. And for that, right, the compiler would have to be able to instantiate that lambda with that type. And so the expression has to be a valid expression for that type. And then we'd return true, otherwise we'd return false. And this is exactly what we want. It works in all of these cases. I'm not sure if I have too much time to show you the compile explorer, but essentially here now, I don't have to add any more type traits. I only have these. I have a macro that keeps it nice and short for me so that I can now just test has member and a function wrapper fails with B. But if I actually pass a function, then it would succeed. And even if it's overloaded, if there's a different version, then I don't have to add another specialization. It just create like the compiler creates it for me. So everything here works as we want it to. This is a really useful trick because now we can essentially imitate the requires um, keyword inside an if const expert from C20 inside C17. So we return back here. Yes, and so this is how it would look like if const expert has member, and it's really nice and compact and it does everything we want. So using this, we can now move on to generic free getters. And the motivation for those are that. Um, Say I have these three cases, I have some, they're all inside a function and I don't know, like the, the type of the container I'm receiving might depend on the template type of that function. And so in one case, it might be a vector and I just want to call a function on each item. In another case, it might be a map and I still only want to select the item inside these pairs of, uh, of items and then do the same thing, or it might be a map of a pointer. And depending on my object type, right, I would have to overlay, overload my function to deal with each object type. I would much prefer it if I could just uh, have a sort of sort of common getter that re returns the object I'm looking for, and then I have this common interface that I just interact with. And additionally, what I'd like is that this get method can be specialized for different types, such that it'll look for specific function names or member names, and uh, and yeah, return the result of those for me. And so since we need to be able to specialize this for individual types, this time we can't use a function overload. We actually need a type trait. And so we have a common function object that has this call operator. And uh, in usage, this would look like this. We would have get length, we'd have to instantiate that object, and then we could call it on an argument. That's not great, but at the on the other hand, we have this benefit that now if I want to extract some type from an object, um, I don't have to write some kind of lambda there. I can just use this function object and pass it along. 
but I still want this uh, syntax here to, to be slightly different. So I can define a free function that calls that that like constructs this uh, function object and then calls um, calls it on the argument that we're passing. And now we have the best of both worlds. We can pass it as a function object when we need, and in all other cases, we can just call the function directly. And in the execution, it would look like this. So we instantiate the object inside the get function and pass along the argument. And inside the, um, the function object, we then call a default implementation that's going to handle the previous cases, like checking if the input is a pair and then right, returning the second element or if it's a pointer to dereference the pointer and then to check all these cases. So the execution, uh, it's a bit much, but let's go through it bit by bit. So here again, I'm making use of a lot of if const experts. And in the first case, I'm checking if the input that I'm passing is exactly what, uh, what I'm also asking for. In which case I check if it's a primitive type or an enumeration. And then I return a value, but in all other cases, I forward the, the input as is, so it might be a reference or an R value reference, like uh, then I'm not picky about it, but I can't pass a reference to an enum that would give me an error. So you have to make sure that it's returned as a value. Then if the types don't match, I try other cases. I look if the input is actually a pointer, in which case I dereference the pointer and then call the whole cascade again on that dereference pointer. And if it's not a pointer, then I check if it's a pair, do the same thing. So here I have uh, another type trait that I defined, which essentially just calls, uh, checks if current of calling get on this object, so on the first of that object, would not return void to me. Um, you can see that here in line 25, where I return, L, uh, return nothing, so I return void. And so these get calls would return void if there is no match. And that way I can check if first would match that contains that type, then return the type from first, otherwise return second. And yeah, then we have some more cases. So if it's a reference wrapper or a smart pointer, I can look for get. And if it's a step optional, I can look for a value. And now this handles a ton of cases for me and I don't have to think about how I'm passing data through my functions. Um, this get function, as long as I call get at the end of it, um, I can just use it as though I receive it as a reference or a value depending on the type. Uh, and yeah, let's take a look at uh, the compiler explorer here as well. So here I need a lot more things and you'll see that I have a lot of type traits defined. So a smart pointer is a combination. Well, uh, is pointer here is a combination of a smart pointer and the classic standard is pointer. Mm, return type is a special relation I need for things like when I say get distance, I don't actually expect distance as a return type, I expect a double. And so in most cases, the return type is just the type itself, but then I can specialize it for certain cases where I don't want it to be exactly that type. And yeah, there's a lot of little things and I'll, I'll share links to these godballs at the end. I think there's uh, some code that you might want to harvest and reuse in, in your projects if you ever find yourself in a similar predicament where you have these different cases and you want to cover all of them. Um, and yeah, at the end I can now, for instance, have a pair of an int and a double pointer and I could just say get double and it manages to get the double. So here, right, I have a pointer to 3.5 and this gets cast to an int so the program returns three. Right, so now we can move on to the third point, which is succinct trait specialization. So we just defined this get function object and we'll have to specialize it for essentially all types in OZQL. One example would be get lane, where I don't just want it to find pointers to a lane or pairs that contain a lane. I also want it to look for objects that have a get lane method or lane as a member variable. And in those cases, I then want to return that. So the specialization would look like this. We, we yeah, specialize the type, provide the call operator. And if our methods or our members aren't present, then we do the default gets. Now, I don't want to do this for every single type in OZQL. And so what would be nice is if I can define a macro 
that does this for me, that generates this code for me. And this is actually a very common practice with libraries. Um, one example would be Boost, and this is also from OZQL. I, um, I register certain types in OZQL to be compatible with Boost methods. Um, and in some cases, it's just a single line <coughs> where um, X and Y are members of my XY class. But in other cases, um, like with OZ types, I don't have direct access to the members, so I have to go more in depth. And yeah, it's quite a lot of boilerplate. It's quite a lot of code, but essentially it's very common for libraries to let you specialize ways to manipulate your data such that it can work on any type, even types that it didn't define itself. So in our case, we would have to write this macro. <coughs> and a macro is not part of the C++ compiler. It's, it's part of the C uh, prop, uh, preprocessor. So it doesn't have access to the sort of type evaluation and, and operational logic that a compiler has. And so it, it's really just text replacement. And uh, in this case, we, we have one name type. So whatever we pass into a specialized get, that's going to be replaced with this text. And then we have a variadic type, which we um, um, insert in here using this keyword VAR, because that's uh, yeah, just how it's defined. And yeah, I have this separation from the actual implementation because as previously shown, in some cases, you know, a user might want to specially select, uh, especially target certain behaviors and then manually define others. And so in this case, separating these and first it's the, it's the class specialization, then it's the operator definition. And inside the operator definition, we have another macro that makes these repeated if const expert calls, else if const expert, else if const expert. Um, and the, the way this text replacement works is that everything is going to be replaced before compilation uh, in a single line. And so we can't actually have line breaks, so I have to add a backslash at the end of each line. I wish I could go more in depth into macros, but uh, I think this is enough to get a vague idea of how they work. And uh, yeah, so, so we have specialized get, we have specialized get operator, and now there's still this tget macro. And that's going to expand to this if const expert has member check and then return get. So right, we've combined all our previous um, kind of tricks. Um, and now we want to call this, but we don't know how off, how many different if const expers we want to add. And in C macros, we, we can't use recursion. So uh, one way to kind of fake it can add uh, six versions, you know, up to six additional arguments. And then here, this is the tget we're actually calling. It receives, in the case of the lane, we have first lane as the type. Then we have get lane as the one way to access it, and lane as the member variable, a third way to access it. So we have three arguments. And so this expands to three arguments plus these six arguments, so a total of nine arguments. And uh, this is another macro, so this will expand. And all it does is it expands to the eighth argument we're passing which would be this t get two, And then t get two with the arguments we're passing would then expand to this definition in line eight. And so, yeah, we're essentially getting this unrolled fake recursion where it now expands to t get one, else t get one with first with get lane and then with lane. And so we have if const expert and then has lane get lane or has type get lane, yeah, uh, and then else if const expert has type lane. So that will automatically generate these for us, and now we can use it by setting the, well, okay, set return type, that's, that was from previously, but yeah, we can specialize this now for each of our types, and it's really nice and succinct and covers a lot of ground. And here in, in the, the case of my road, we, we have get road and road, but I also wanted to work with types that only have a get lane method. So they would have to call get lane and then on get lane, they would have to call get road. So a nice way to do that is to tell it, oh, you can also access the road via get lane. So I can also provide these accessors and it'll just, yeah, all that compile time deal with the 
different ways to access the road from any type. So this brings us to the last addition, which is that I have a bunch of structures that contain different data. And usually these are outputs from certain queries you perform inside OZQL, like getting all objects on a route and you want to have them sorted by distance and the route consists of nodes. So you would get something like a relation. And in order for these relations to be sortable, um, I actually don't want to store the object. Well, I certainly don't want to store it as a value because who knows how big that object is, but uh, storing it as a const reference or something that would prevent me from reordering the array in most cases, or the vector in most cases. So uh, I actually want to store it as a pointer, but I don't want the user to access it as though it were a pointer. And so I provide this get method, uh, but at the same time now, the user requested a set of all traffic signs along a route. And so I would have to specialize this for traffic signs because I want the interface to be nice and easy to use. And you can notice how all the things, like if I have any more behavior related to a relation, then I would have to duplicate these implementations. And so it comes yeah, obvious quite quickly that we want to reuse implementation here. We want to say if this is a template type T, then I want to define in one place that it'll have it'll always have a get traffic sign uh, method. And that I could reuse this for all three of these structures instead of having to specialize them and having lots of duplication. And so the idea is to have these structures all inherit from a has class. And I tell the has class here, in this case, you store the object as a pointer. And then the rest uh, remains unchanged. And what this has class needs is it needs a get method so that if I don't know, right, if my template type is uh, dependent, that I can still access the underlying type without needing to know the name of the function. But I also need to specialize it to add these custom get traffic sign, get moving objects methods. And I need all of these has versions to have a common base such that I only define this once and it'll work for a const t value, it'll work for a t pointer, it'll work for a reference wrapper of t for all of these versions. And one more thing that I need is that if I have a class that inherits from multiple of these has classes, I need a way for it to know which get version, which get implementation actually would return the type that I'm asking for. And so I need an aggregate class that tests for me which of these uh, base classes actually has the member I'm looking for, and then disambiguates that and returns the value I want. So the initial approach here is to first define that base class that every has class would inherit from. And the way we do that is to give it a second template type that differentiates between the type that it has uh, and, and that you access and the way it is stored. And then yeah, we have the store type and I'll skip over the constructor, but uh, yeah, I've marked it as work in progress because this is a code that I only use in OZQL and it's not uh, outward facing yet. And so I'll still have to clean it up. I noticed for instance that store type isn't correct here. I would actually have to forward it as a type T because that's what it is. But for me it works because uh, store type and the type I'm passing are always the same inside OZQL. But if I were to make this <coughs> available to the outside user, then I still have to clean it up first. But just to give you the gist of how this would work is essentially now I implement this get method that I wanted. And it does the similar things as my free get function that I had. Um, it's, it checks if it's a pointer, checks if it uh, has a get, so if it's a smart pointer or a reference wrapper. If, um, or I guess smart pointer is already covered by my pointer check. And value if it's, uh, it's also something I need for uh, OZ types, so it's also very OZ specific in this case. And then we can also delve into the type that's stored and see if that contains the type we're asking for. And now we can reuse this in all of our has versions. So you have a version with const t, with t pointer, const t pointer, t reference, reference, and all of them inherit from this detail has. And essentially, Right, we, we only want to pass one type when we instantiate this type, and the second one is then the same as the stored type. Uh, and yeah, and then we 
we turn the first type into the common version of that type. And now when we specialize has, we only have to specialize one version of it and it'll apply to every variation in which this data can be stored. <laughs> now, when it comes to the aggregate class, yeah, we have an aggregate that has multiple types and it inherits from each of the has for the type individually. And now we have to implement get in a way that it finds out which type actually has the type we're asking for. And the way I do it here is to essentially check, uh, to, to I pass every type that it has, and then one by one, I look at the first one, and if it doesn't have it, I discard it and try with the next type. And then here I'm checking, the, the term I'm using for it is is void v, so we know that my get method returns void if the type is not found inside that object at compile time. And uh, if, if there's no types left, then I return void as well. But if it isn't void, then I can use the base class with that specific type and use its get method to return the value I'm looking for. And now when it comes to specializing this has class, um, I essentially have one version that in, uh, inherits from the detail has version and I can add my own method. So I can have a const version of get lane, a non-const version of get lane, same with get road. And so these would be the common things that any class that has a lane can also directly access its road. It can directly access what side of the road it is on. And this keeps my interface uh, pretty flat. Like I don't have to make these long chains of gets, get, 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 gets. Um, and yeah, it keeps the, the interface of OZQL nice and short. Ooh. Now, yeah, I also have a work in progress here. That would be nice if I could make this specialization into a macro as well, but I haven't used it that often yet that I would need it. So, OZQL is still growing, and at its base are all of these little nifty tricks that I'm using to keep the, the, the work I have to do in order to implement methods uh, pretty low, and means I can iterate on it quite quickly. So yeah, that's all I've got. Thank you for listening to this talk and feel free to take a look at the OC Query Library repository.